So here we are in igniting our practice. Is anybody in the room actually on fire? <laughs> no, I don't think so, right? OK, so this tells us, if we didn't know already, of course, that metaphors are ubiquitous. And they have been a favorite topic recently among cognitive scientists. I am not a cognitive scientist, so I am going to talk about metaphors and their close cousins, similes, as a poet. And the main tools of poets are what? Words. That's it. So I am going to talk about metaphors and similes as meaningful or logical collections of words. So here's my question, for my first question. What is the difference between a metaphor and a simile? Stretch your mind back to grade five. Like and as. OK. So which is it that uses the like or as? A simile uses a like or as. OK. Um, how is a metaphor like a simile? <laughs> what do they share in common? Aha, we say, oh, damn it, why didn't they ask that question in grade five? <laughs> they are comparisons, right. Two forms of comparison. Metaphors and similes differed, in my mind, only in the degree or the intensity of a comparison between two objects. So. Um, here's the first line of a poem that I wrote two days ago. I'm not going to write the whole line down, I think. An unsold book is like an ingrown hair. OK, is that a simile or a metaphor? It's a simile. I could redo it, right? And I could have it be an unsold book is an ingrown hair. And then it, it's a, a metaphor, right? OK. So. We can explain this visually, and we have a board, so let's just do that. Um, OK. So a simile is like a Venn diagram, <laughs> right? Here's our Venn diagram. So in here, we have apparently um, unsold book and ingrown hair. And what does that imply about them? that they have properties in common, right? They share aspects in common. They're itchy, they piss you off, they are in the wrong place, they have not yet broken out, et cetera, right? OK? <laughs> yes. So if I wanted to make that visualization into a metaphor, what would I do? Basically, yes. That's actually much more efficient than what I was going to do. Listen to him. Um, <laughs> erase the outside part, or lift up this and go and put it right exactly over top, right? It expresses full superimposition. There are then no edges left, right? And then we have an unsold book is an ingrown hair. OK, do we see anything wrong with this as an expression? Is an unsold book literally an ingrown hair? No. So a metaphor asks you to do something which is impossible. Right? to perform a perfect and full superimposition. This, I think, is actually the, the coolest part of metaphors. I note, in passing, as a Middle English person, that <laughs> a Venn diagram was invented in 1880 right, by John Venn to describe set theory. The words like and as both go back to Anglo-Saxon, elik and alswa. They have therefore been in use in the English language for more than 1,500 years. They have been used to build the logical relationship of simile for a very long time. Language, in other words, has been and is still, in my opinion, the primary vehicle for conveying logic to most people most of the time. So our metaphor, then, I think, is a kind of hypothetical. It asks you to perform, each time, a micro and very fast thought experiment. So what I'm saying is, what if an unsold book were an ingrown hair? Or if an unsold book is an ingrown hair, what might that mean? And then we start enumerating, it's itchy, it has not broken out, it is in the wrong place, it is, you know, may require surgery, blah, blah, right? OK? So 
This is something for any French speakers or Romance speakers or actually practically any other speakers except English speakers in this room. <laughs> so, and this is metaphors are especially ubiquitous in English and they look very drastic in English because English has a very stupid verbal system <laughs> in which we only ever use the indicative. Most other languages, certainly all Romance languages like French, for example, can use a subjunctive, <laughs> sometimes a conditional, but mostly a subjunctive. They have a fully conjugated form that will indicate both the strong emotion and the contrary to factness that is at work in most metaphors. So we say orange is the new black. We don't say orange might be the new black. It can be the new black. If only orange were the new black. Well, if you spoke French, you could and would say all those things all the time. And metaphoring would be different in your language. So here's my bit of math. Here's one final way that you can understand the operations that you're performing in simile and metaphor. We can use elementary algebra. I am terrible at algebra, and I never got any further than elementary, but I can tell you that it means putting the pieces together in medieval Arabic. And this is incredibly useful. Why did no one tell me that in grade seven? Okay, so in arithmetic, right, you express all your terms. So whatever, like, what did I say? I said this, right? You know, Amazingly, I feel fairly solid about that, <laughs> um, you know, but algebra, the putting the pieces together version, this is where they lost me in grade five, right, is two plus whatever A equals five. Well, this, it just occurred to me now, requires a completely different and much more systematic understanding of what the hell is going on in the structure than the first one, right? So in the first arith arithmetical question, right, if I set, set a task or I pose a problem, uh, we would describe the actions that we do there, right, as what, counting, uh, reckoning, uh, adding, equating, defining, following a rule of addition. In algebra, if I say solve for A or tell me what A is, you have, to ha you have there all the parts. There is a sign for each part of the logical relationship. You have to understand the operation of adding and its inverse, subtracting, to get the answer, the missing term, right? So five minus two is three. That gives you three, which gives you five. And you need to have a sophisticated understanding, therefore, of all the possible relationships of all the parts. This is what algebra means. Wow. <laughs> I just learned that very recently. And if someone had told me in grade five how much algebra was like poetry, I would probably be in a different department. <laughs> okay, so um, unsold book equals ingrown hair. This is where I'm going. I think that the process in algebra, right, is meaningfully enabled by the missing or hidden term, the one that we pretend not to know or have to solve for. And I think, therefore, that metaphor is algebra. You see what I did there? <laughs> OK. Metaphor is a form of algebra. So unsold book equals ingrown hair. We know that that is illogical, right? What we say, no, that is not a literal statement. This would be like saying three equals five. No, 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 wrong. However, we know that by performing various operations on three, we could make it into five, like adding two. And likewise, we know that we could perform various operations, various verbal and conceptual operations on unsold book to make it into ingrown hair. Now, these operations are much more complex than that very simple one. Um, and they would take pages and pages and pages to write out. And this huge calculation runs in our minds every time we hear a metaphor. Therefore, in fact, metaphors are incredibly efficient. So many people will tell you, and I think they're right, that metaphors are about finding similarities between things. It's also true that they are about finding differences. And this is why 
improbable metaphors are often the most effective because a metaphor is, among other things, a kind of logical insult. It is meant to upset or shock, to cause an emotional reaction that will speed up processing. You might experience a feeling of kind of instant recognition or illumination the way you do with a good metaphor. You have performed those calculations and they have stacked up or worked out. Or you may feel confusion and rejection, in which case those calculations did not work out. And this is a very instantaneous feeling. Rarely, but sometimes, working through a metaphor that you didn't see the first time will actually increase its explanatory power, but I have to say, not usually. <laughs> It's usually a very fast process. So here is my exercise. This exercise, the results of it, if you want to, we might have time to share a couple now, but you can uh, tweet them or you can email them and they will be collected and probably used in the presentation e part of this subsequently. Okay, so everybody take an object out of your bag that is not your phone. <laughs> Okay, compare this object with the object of the person sitting next to you. Make sure that they are not the same object. <laughs> Notice their similarities and differences. Okay, this is the hard part. I want you to assume that object A that you have is object B that your partner has. Think about that for a while. You are making a new metaphor. See if you can make that relationship meaningful. A is B. Here is my hint. A good way of getting this to work for you is to find a small defining difference. So you have a marker and the person next to you has a lipstick. A lipstick is a marker for your face, right? Okay, think in those terms and you can bring almost any two objects together. One, two, three, go. Should I, should I, do they need a little more time? Should I give them a minute or two more and then ask no. for a couple or let, just let them roll for a moment? Ask and... for one now and tell them to tweet the rest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna ask for two. One is always too hard. Okay. Okay. Out of all of the people in this room, can we get two that we're actually satisfied with? I just, I, you know, you liked yours. It worked well. You won't be too embarrassed just to utter it in this room. Can anybody give me the joint metaphor that they came up with? The rest of you can safely tweet yours or post them, but can I get one? Way up at the back and you'll have to yell. A day planner is a pen for your life. Oh, nice one. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm, this works for me. I'm fine with that. A day planner is a pen for your life. Okay, one more. Did anybody? Uh, I see a hand. Yes. Um, in a gray sweater in the middle. Yes. <laughs> There you go. Right. Okay. See? You can do it, and you do it all the time. Okay. That concludes me. But please do, if you're, pr if you're proud of yours, tweet them <laughs> or email them. <laughs>